Hey guys, uh, tonight we have uh, Mario Gabriel Delgado uh, as our educator. Uh, so Mario is the Spirit Portfolio Manager as, uh, at Tuton uh, Selection. Uh, he's a passionate educator. He's certified in uh, rum, whiskey, cigars, name it. So, uh, you know, any spirit for him is piece of cake. In this case, it's going to be apple cake. Uh, Mario, evolution of the apple in the big apple. Thank you, Nico. Hey, everybody. Welcome. So, I know it's going to be a little bit weird. We're going to start off with just regular apple juice. I want to cover the spectrum of what happens to an apple through fermentation, distillation. There's a lot of historical factors. There's biological factors. There's chemistry factors. But most importantly, what is the role of the apple just for human beings, right? The last time you probably had apple juice was when you were a kid, but it was probably probably like a daily lifestyle, right? It's not something that you have all the time. And as you get older, you'll have yourself having cider um, when you don't have beer available or wine available, right? Um, and usually we don't see too much of the distillation like a Calvados, which comes from France, or an Applejack that's here in the US. People are kind of reserved about it, even though apples are really part of our upbringing. We know that an apple day uh, keeps the doctor away. Someone could be the apple of your eye, your Adam's apple. It's really incorporated into our society, but it gets lost in distillation, and I'm just trying to shed light onto it where it factors in. Um, apple as a fruit, I just find so fascinating in the sense of, they say with evolution that we came down from the trees because we wanted the mushy fruit that fell to the forest floor, or the jungle floor, because it started getting mushy and fermenting, and we'd start eating it up. And then it's like, hey, I really want to make out with that cave woman, or I really want to kill that tribe. And then we said, well, why are we going to stay in the trees where we can go on the ground and get boozy? And they said that that's why we stayed there and eventually became Homo erectus and Homo sapien, because we wanted that, all that mushy food on the fruit floor. Mind you, we were hunters and gatherers back then. But the evolution from that is about 10,000 years ago, we start fermenting on purpose. So instead of just the mushy fruit on the ground, we say, well, we take these seeds and we plant them, or we eat a bunch of them, and we poop out the seeds and fertilize them in a certain area. Now we have farms, and now we have orchards, and we don't have to hunter and gather, we can have these things. But fermentation's always a part of that. And you have something like the apple is a little bit more significant because you know, grapes have to be cultivated and put in vineyards and under certain, um, you know, certain terrains. And with things like grains that we get our beer or our whiskey from, they have to go through a malting process to have a proper fermentation. So things like apples, which are full of fructose, they're ready to rip. They don't have maltose that have to go through conversion with the grains. Um, sucrose is gonna come from our sugar cane, but it's not gonna be in a lot of regions that um, humans involved in. And then on top of that, that was breeding over time. Sugar cane's in the grass family. We're spe specifically just talking about fruit as a category. Um, you also don't see other things. That trend is slowly changing, but you don't see like pineapple cider, um, which is something that's kind of growing in certain places, or papaya or mango. The apple is really the core, pun intended, uh, about the whole entire thing. So we're starting with apple juice. Apples are in the rose family. Uh, they, we've been using them for mostly fermenting for 10,000 years. Um, apples used to be very bitter. Um, and it took time to evolve them to be sweet enough to actually eat and enjoy on their own. Uh, there's four categories of apples that we work with, whether it's going to be apple juice, cider, or an apple distillate. So you have your um, tart and your sour. That's to give you a little bit of balance to your product. That's usually the smallest amount that you're using, whether you're making um, a cider or a spirit. Um, you have bitter apples. You typically see that in cider. Uh, so that'll make up usually the biggest proportion of your cider or your distillate. And then you have bittersweet, which does a little bit of bitter and sweet just for fermentation, and then pure sweet apples for fermentation. So your apple juice is going to focus a lot more on those sweet apples, but that totally changes once you get to these spirits. These are going to focus at least 50% of bittersweet or bitter apples um, in your fermentation um, or in the quote-unquote mash bill for those. Um, so about 10,000 years ago, we're we're harvesting it. The Romans would actually put the apples in their olive presses and drink that. Um, we don't recognize apple juice as the beverage we drink nowadays until about the 1800s where pasteurization took place, um, thanks to a gentleman, Louis Pasteur, in the mid-1800s, because apple juice would just get funky on you, right? We cut an apple, it starts browning, it starts releasing something called ethylene, 
So when they say one bad apple spoils the bunch, it's an actual process. So the apple, once it goes bad, releases ethylene, makes the other apples release ethylene, and the whole thing goes bad. Um, but when it starts going bad and going mushy, that's when you can start going through your fermentation process, you know, before, we, as we know it, in the 1800s and 1900s. Um, so the apple has all these things to work with just on its own. Whether it's us harvesting it, becoming apple juice once it's pasteurized, the Romans were drinking apple cider, even before then and after then we're enjoying it now. Um, I want you to think of apples in the category of kind of like a semi-dry fermentation base. So if you look at Europe, there's a grape grain line. So Italy, Spain, Portugal, lots of grapes. Uh, Ireland, Scotland, Sweden, UK, lots of grains. Apples sit between those two regions. So I can take my grapes, I can squish it, I make grape juice, I ferment it, and I end up with wine. If you take your grains, we have to malt them, but again, they've evolved so that grains are dried and they handle those colder climates better, and grapes, they handle the warmer climates better, but an apple, too hot, the apples get mushy, too cold, they'll freeze up on you. So you need a very particular region, which is going to be um, the Normandy region. Right? Normandy region is where the English Channel is between the UK and France. We also have it here in, in, the, in the Northeast in the US, like New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, really great apple growing regions. Not too hot, not too cold. Um, their uh, apples have a stigma of being poisonous, right? We have Snow White that we deal with that. There actually are certain breeds of apples that are poisonous. And there is cyanide in the apple seed, but you would have to eat a lot of apple seeds and you'd have to actually break the shell. So even if you eat a couple seeds, you never break the shell of that seed, you won't die from any type of cyanide poisoning. Just a few things to keep in mind. When we go into our fermentation, this part here from cider to Calvados is going to be out of the Normandy region in France. Really great region for growing apples, also pears. Um, same Normandy region as the um, Normandy Beach during World War II, the Hundred Years' War between the French and the English in the 14th and 15th century, all the Normandy region, that's what they were fighting for. It's right across the UK Channel. If you hear about the Duke of Normandy, that is an English title, but it is for the French property. The French eventually won it um, in about the 1500s. So that area is really great for growing um, apples and pears, but they also have strict regulations with the French government. French government is really good at regulating their products. They have a certain consistency that they want to meet, they want to be at, and so they have their standards set. So right after our apple juice, I want to get into the cider. Just like uh, the apple juice you had before, the cider is going to be organic as well. Now there's plenty of American apple ciders out there. French apple ciders tend to be a lot drier. And just so you're familiar with fermentation, so we're taking our regular apple juice. We're gonna dilute it a little bit just so the acidity is not too much to kill the yeast that are gonna come into play. Um, you wanna do a fermentation fairly quickly because just like yeast, bacteria like to eat sugar. And if the bacteria eat that sugar, there's less sugar for the fermentation. And it's also gonna affect your flavor. And so what you have is you have these big sugar chains going on, the yeast is coming in, and basically it's like Pac-Man. It's just eating up the dots that are there, and the yeast eat up the sugar, and they produce ethanol alcohol. That's that uh, <laughs> boom boom juice that makes us dance and feel better about ourselves and look better, right? And so that's the separation in any process. You're going to have wine, you're going to have beer, or you're going to have cider. Fermentation is the first part. That is the biology that takes place. We wouldn't have anything with live, living, active yeast to produce that ethanol for us. That's the only way we're gonna accomplish that. And again, this is going to be a little bit higher ABV than our ancestors would have had. When you have natural fermentation, it takes a little bit longer and you're gonna sit around one to 3% alcohol. Um, this is gonna be much more, this would be 4% alcohol, but that's one of the standards that France wants. They don't want a cider that's more than 6%. It's meant to be a table beverage. You're meant to drink it all day. You know, it's always going to be what you have extra of. So if I'm a Normandy farmer, whether it's hundreds of years ago or today, I have excess blank. 
and fermentation is going to be the best way to make a little bit of money before my crops go bad. And the same thing will play into distillation where we're going to concentrate that because if we look at our ciders, we look at our beers, we look at our wine, there's only a certain amount of time that they'll last if they're not bottled. So being able to distill it and concentrate it gives us way more life, gives us more money in the bank. And also less volume to deal with because, you know, for every, for 100 gallons of cider at 6%, I could sell a dozen uh, gallons of a distillate, like a Calvados or an Applejack. So what you're going to have is a fairly quick fermentation when you're dealing with cider that's just for enjoying on its own. Even though we need a cider to get into our Calvados kind of category, it's much quicker and it's going to be a little bit sweeter. You're going to have a much drier apple when it comes to your French distillates. Um, so these go through quicker. Well, it'll take three to four months, three weeks to four months for a Calvados cider. You can have a regular drinking cider within a couple of weeks. It's meant to be enjoyed that way. Uh, there are ciders, you know, this could be a single fermentation on this one that we have here, but there are other ciders where they introduce yeast later on and they end up with kind of like a Cremant sparkling wine style. So if you ever see the cork and cage ciders, they're just pitching more yeast, they're eating some more of the residual sugar and they're getting some carbonation. Those are kind of like fine ciders or like a fine champagne. Uh, there is a region called Pay Doge that is in the Normandy uh, region where they make all the cider and make the Calvados. These come from the same region, even though cider can be made anywhere. Pay Doge is a AOC, an appellation of controlly from the French government. They're protecting how the product is made, why it's made, the choices that are done um, in the process. Uh, so this one is going to not exceed more than 6% fermentation. You can't have more than 70%, you need a minimum of 70% bitter apples, but no more than 15% tart or acidic apples um, in your vineyards. This is going to probably sit in like a fodder and it'll just ferment and they'll bottle it. Um, it's typically not seen in a barrel, it would specify on the label if it's like a barrel H cider or not. Um, so just to focus on the profile, um, Dry, acidic, tart, we got one here. And of course, much different than the apple juice we had. The nose might be similar, but we have carbonation, we have some tartness, we have apple skins. The French government also makes sure that they don't add any sugar, they don't put sulfur so they can extend the life of the um, juice once it's oxidized. Um, they're really looking out to protect you. That'll cut back on headaches and other things like that. Something really interesting that you don't see too often is a Pomo de Normandy. Again, we're talking about the Normandy region. Uh, there's a category called Mistel, if we're familiar with that. So Mistel basically means like a fortified wine, but it's a little bit sweeter than a fortified wine. So you don't want to treat it like a port. Um, there's another product out of France called Pinot de Charance which goes through a similar process. But what we're doing is we're taking our Calvados and it depends on the producer, but you can add a low ABV cider or an unfermented apple juice and you're diluting it. So this is going to be 4% alcohol in the cider that we had. And then we're going to jump up to 16%. So this is a fortified apple juice or apple cider, very different animal. Again, we're going to focus more on the bitter apples. So when we try this, it's going to be a little bit more, in a good way, briny. It's going to be bitter, briny. It's going to have this kind of um, aperitif quality, and that's how it's used in France. It's used as an aperitif. So it'll be a little bit darker because when we deal with Calvados, there is no unaged Calvados. An American Applejack, you can have you know, your white lightning or your apple lightning, no color um, from any of the aging. Calvados is always a minimum of two years. Um, even the most basic kind is two years. So a little bit more color, you have some apple juice, so we have dark color. Again, the qualities are gonna be so different. So with Pommel de Normandy, you know, we, we're fortifying it because we're stopping the, any type of fermentation that's gonna to happen to that apple juice. Remember, that apple juice is ready to go, ready to ferment, ready to become the next best product. And so adding the alcohol of the Calvados is gonna neutralize it, stop it from fermenting further, 
and create this really unique character. When it comes to a Pomelo de Normandy though, you, can, you usually only have about 25% Calvados and the other 75% is going to be your cider, is going to be your juice. Um, it's aged for 14 months. So at least this one always goes through an aging process unlike the cider. And you can try, again, it's treated like an aperitif before a meal. Briny, fleshy, really dry. And you know, sometimes the booze comes through, it kind of goes up and down. Very different from our cider, which can be straightforward, still dry, really effervescent, or our juice, really sweet, really direct. And something like a cider or a Pomelo de Normandy has been part of French drinking probably since the year 1000 or so. Um, like I said, that region has always been good for apples. The way the apples we even have nowadays have evolved is there's the uh, Malice Silvestri apple and then there's a European crab apple. And it was a matter of the spores that we carried with us when we traveled through Europe or from digestion and <laughs> releasing it out into the fields in a different part of the world. Um, we have the apples that we join nowadays. The type of apples you're using for these don't look like our Granny Smith or our Gala apples that are nice, big, and juicy. They're more like crab apples. They're dense, and that's where all the bitterness comes from. Um, you, it's actually nearly impossible to grow an apple from seed, so you just can't take the seed or the apple you have in the supermarket, plant it, and hope another one grows. Um, it goes through a different type of process, but these seeds can. Since they're crab apples, they're not meant con for consuming. Um, you can just replant these seeds anytime you want and you're going to grow your additional apple trees in there. Uh, so that's the type that are in there with the, with the uh, crab apple as the base. Um, with Calvados, now we're going to the brandy category. So we have our fermented fruit juice, we have our Pomo de Normandy, which is like a Mistel, and then the Calvados and the Apple Jacks will fall under the brandy category. Now, brandy could be any spirit fermented from a juice. We're really familiar with cognac or grape brandy. They can just say brandy on the label. If you use anything besides grapes, you do have to specify on your label. So if it's with cherries, cherry brandy, apples, apple brandy, but all the brandy category. Um, so with the Calvados, it's going to be around 500 years old. Um, that's around the time that we have distillation taking place, cognac which is a very different region. It's a little bit more south. You know, when we look at Normandy, like I said, it's the English Channel. It's about a little bit west of Paris. You have Cognac, which is a little bit lower than that. Uh, and a lot of us know Provence, which is the kind of Mediterranean climate. That's where all the rosé comes from, a little bit different type of soil. But the drinking culture changes all throughout France. And it's a matter of climate, and it's a matter about historical significance. Uh, Normandy itself comes from the, the Northmen or the Norsemen, it was Vikings who have kind of conquered that territory and that got its original name of Normandy. Um, so it has a long significant history and they think it's because of those, of those Vikings, that's why there's even a bigger source of apples uh, because they were cultivating there and not the original settlers in France or in the UK. Um, so the Calvados, again, strict standards with the uh, appellation of control from the French government. They want to make sure they get their money's worth. When you're harvesting your apples, you're going to be from September to December. There's over 40 different varieties that you can use in your Calvados. Cider is a little bit more strict. You can't have more than 70% of one variety of apple in your ciders in France. With Calvados, they don't care about that as much, but again, you need that balance of apples. When you have your Calvados, you're going to have 50% bitter apples, 20% bittersweet, 20% sweet apples, and only about 10% of the tart apples. The, the tart actually keeps the um, ferment lasting a little bit longer. It keeps the bacteria away, keeps the acidity up, um, but you don't need too much of it. It'll, it'll turn your beverage sour. Um, and again, the bitter is so that the final product has this really nice drinkability to it. It's just not uh, fermented and distilled apple juice. Um, the, like I mentioned before, the fermentation is going to be about three weeks to four months, specifically with Calvados. Uh, we won't have that same type of regulation when it comes to an American Applejack or anything like that. Um, the juice is filtered. It is actually with a lower, a, a higher ABV than you have with cider. The French government doesn't really want you going over 6% on 
on the cider, but when you have your Calvados, the higher fermentation you get, the higher distillation you get. You know, with alcohol, it's, you're never creating it, you're concentrating it. So when you go through your distillation process, say I have a 10% a um, cider that I created for my Calvados. I'm gonna take that and I'm going to put it, let's say in a pot still or a, or a Charentes, which is the same thing they use with cognac. And basically a pot still is grandma sauce pot. It's slow, it's slow, it's time consuming, um, but you get more flavor, everything's cooking in on itself. You also have a column still, which is for some categories of Calvados and other distillates too. So what we're having here with the regular Calvados, it's going to, you're gonna put your 10% cider into the pot for the first distillation, and you're gonna end up with about 30% alcohol. It's gonna be still really cloudy, there's a lot of oils in there, because we're dealing with fat, oils, and acids when we're dealing with any type of fermentable product. These are just batteries, right? So what they want to do is they want to be planted in the ground and grow again. It's all about photosynthesis, whether it's grapes, whether it's grains, sugar canes, or apples. Sunlight's coming down, the seed grows, 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 but we don't have, you know, 90 foot tall apple trees. They reach a certain point, and then that creates more batteries. It's still, photosynthesis is still giving us sunlight, but it's creating these apples because it needs a place to put the rest of that sunlight. And those things can be taken and planted elsewhere. And so we're taking that energy from the sun and we're making sure that we have all the sugar that's there. And it's natural fermentation. It's actually sugar through photosynthesis that makes the plants grow. Um, for some of us, sugar makes us grow out this way, unfortunately, <laughs> not up like a tree. Um, but we're taking that process, we're using up those sugars and fermentation after photosynthesis and then we're concentrating it. So what we're doing is distillation, we're extracting the water. We're, we're, like I said, we can't create more alcohol. So I have 10%, I remove water, I end up with 30, cloudy and oily, and then I uh, distill that one more time, and I'll end up about 70%. Um, that's with a regular fermentation that you, uh, distillation like you'd see with maybe a, a cognac or a whiskey. Uh, but Calvados, you're gonna see closer to 55, 65. They want you to get a lot of that apple flavor and the more you distill, the more neutral something becomes. So we, we're familiar with a neutral spirit. Maybe you had a bad experience in college called, uh, <laughs> called Everclear or Spiritus. And that's because you're distilling to 95% alcohol, but that only leaves a 5% room to have more flavor or have water. The rest is just pure ethanol. Um, and so what they end up doing is proofing it down. But so that's what's separating from your Calvados or your whiskey from your vodkas. You want to have less distillation, less distillation to give me more of that flavor, more of those fats, more of those acids. Um, so this will be around 55%. There's three categories in Calvados uh, for regions, more or less. You have the Calvados regular AOC, which is two years aging. It could be distilled in a polym, uh, column or a pot still, and you can use any combination of apples and pears. Pears are really good in the Normandy region as well. So I'll have you try this. This is going to be 40% alcohol, but this is what's going to be designated as the regular Calvados AOC. Uh, there's also a category called Dome Frontain. That means it needs a minimum of 30% pears. It has to be aged for three years instead of just two years, and it has to be column still. Again, column still is more like the microwave, right? The pot stills grandma's sauce pot. The microwave, it's quick, it's hot, it's fast, it gets the job done. And so what happens is when you take your col column still, you're putting a bunch of plates in there, in one column and they're stacked up. The more plates there are, the more surface area. The more surface area, the more the ethanol has to work to go up and the water to go down. Because ethanol evaporates before water does. So water steams at 212, Ethanol vaporizes at 173. So you have about a 40 degree cushion where ethanol is coming out and that's what's coming out of your stills and then you chill it and then it concentrates into a liquid again. But where you're leaving behind is color and everything else. So that's why when you see the layers, you know, the lightning Applejack and it's crystal clear, in the distillation process, the molecules for color are just too heavy. They don't carry over with the vapor. So anything that distills comes out crystal clear. That's your white dog, that's your white lightning. 
And so Calvados always going to be aged and that color is going to be coming from the oak, none of it from the apple juice or any other influence. There are certain categories of spirits like a scotch that you're allowed to use caramel coloring, caramel E140E, I think it is. And with Calvados, that's not going to be the case. It is going to be a lighter color, even the amount of aging, because those folders that I mentioned before for fermentation, even some final distillate, like the, the clear Calvados can end up in a photo as well. And those can hold up to 250 to 2,500 gallons of spirit. And so it's gonna be really hard to get any color out of that. But what we're going for is not really color and oak influence. That's more of an American thing. What we're focusing is time. Because if you've ever had um, spirits right off the line or really high proof spirits, it just burns. It's just really intense that ethanol concentration, it's that vapor that's coming off of the bottle. So sometimes you even open the bottle and whiff it and you just kind of get lightheaded. Time is eliminating that. So if you have your spirit and you ferment it and you distill it, you end up with these molecule chains. So let's say I have the flavor of apples because it's Calvados, right? So this is the molecule for apples. But as oxygen influences it, oxygen is really reactive. We breathe O2, but O exists in the environment as well, and it's smaller than the oxygen molecule. So this apple molecule now will turn into vanilla, and then cinnamon, and then nutmeg. So one chain can introduce all these different flavors, and that's only with time. So there's been plenty of big brands that have tried to introduce music, or vibrations, or oak chips inside of their barrels to give it more color, more flavor, but the best flavors come from time, and you can never replace that. That's why when we deal with the Dome Fontaine, which uses the column still, it has to age for three years because it's going to be much sharper, right? That's a column still is what you use for your vodka, for your neutral spirit, for your gins. It's going to be a little bit sharper. So it needs that little bit extra time of aging for more intense flavor. So the one you have now is just going to be a regular um, Calvados from the region. Again, could be column still, could be pot still. Um, it's going to follow the rules of like the cider, a certain per percentage. Um, and so the pay dodge that we're going to is going to be much more strict. It's the Eastern region of Calvados. And this one has to be pot still. It also can't be more than 30% pears. So most of the pay dodge, as you see, they're going to be closer to 85 or 90% just pure apple where the Dom Fontaine is a minimum of 30% pear and the regular Calvados category could be any amount of pear, any amount of apple. Um, this ages for two years. So the one you're having now is going to be pay dodge, but it's the same exact year as the one before. So you can see where the influence of the percentage of pairs and the influence, thank you, of the distillation process are going to be very different. Um, but they carry well, they play, play really well in cocktails. And again, one has a little bit more color than the other, so there could be more ink, oak influence in one than the other because sometimes these companies are just gonna do the bare minimum just to hit that category of pay dosh because there's more money in it. 70% of Calvados that's made is the first one that you had, just a regular Calvados category. But in the US, we see pay dosh the most because it's the highest, what we consider highest quality. Kind of like, there's plenty of sparkling wines that come out of France, but we usually see a lot of champagne that we're talking about French sparkling. So even though there's others produce more, this is the one that most people go for. So when you go to this um, liquor store, pay dodge is probably going to be 80% of what on the shelf, but one of the lower ones produced. Uh, there is age statements for those. So with a Calvados, a VS is two years, um, unless we're talking about that Dome Fontaine, which is three years. Then you have the VOSOP, which is going to be four. So it fits the same line as cognacs or French rums. But then when we get to the XO or the Ors d'Age, that's actually just gonna be six years. Um, the French government actually changed Cognac's XO from six years to 10 years within the last two decades. Um, but before then, if you ever see an XO that predates like 2006, um, if it's Cognac or any other category, it's gonna be six years. So like uh, Rum Agricoles, six years is gonna be an XO. Calvados is, is gonna be an XO as well. Um, now for the American made stuff. We have um, Laird's Applejack. It's out of Scobieville, uh, New Jersey. It is, Applejack is the oldest American spirit. Uh, we give a lot of credit to whiskey and beer and bourbon, but Applejack was really the first. 
It's been made for about 400 years um, in New York State. Uh, it gets its name from apple jacking, which is a very specific process. Um, we talked about the chemistry of distillation when we talked about Calvados, where we're heating it up so it vapors the alcohol and taking it off. Cold jacking does the opposite. Um, we know if we put a bottle of freezer of uh, vodka in the freezer, it won't freeze up on us because there's enough alcohol going on. But what Applejack does is take a cider, which could be lower alcohol, like 4%. They would put it in a barrel, and they had the choice of either burying it in the ground or leaving it outside. But during the winter time, whatever was not alcohol would freeze, right? Our ethanol doesn't freeze, but that apple juice will, that water content. When we talk about cider, um, or we talk about apple juice, 80% of it is water. And so we're going to take our barrel full of cider, we freeze it, and then the apple jacking is because you were breaking off the chunks of ice. That's the jacking part of it. And so what's left behind, you would have to freeze again and again and again. The problem with that process is ethanol is not the only thing that's made when you distill. There's also something called methanol. And so methanol is what they were drinking during prohibition, it would make you go blind in one eye and have a bad leg and stuff like that. Um, our bodies can't break down methanol. The good thing is the cure for methanol poisoning is ethanol. The problem was with prohibition, there wasn't ethanol around. So that's one of the biggest issues. Applejack actually during prohibition was given the medicinal title, so it's still able to be produced. But the teetotalers that were around would actually still actively burn the apple orchards because they knew it could be made into cider or into uh, Applejack. So they would destroy orchards all the time. A lot of the orchards we have in the US are thanks to uh, Johnny Appleseed. If you're familiar with the American legend, he was a real person. Uh, but Johnny, Johnny Appleseed wasn't planting those apples that we eat. He was actually planting apples for cider or for Applejack production. Um, there was less taxation on cider than there was on beer and whiskey at the time. And also to be a homesteader and to have rights to land in the US, you needed to have apple trees on there to show that you're producing something. So what he did is he traveled the country, bought tracks of, tracks of land, planted a bunch of apple trees. And when he came back, he said, look, these are ready to, to start going because some apple trees take three to 10 years to produce apples. And he flipped it, it was a business. And so he was doing it so people could get their booze there could be less taxation and they could have homes, which wasn't always the option back in that day. Um, and we're talking about the 1700s in the US. Uh, some things and differences between Applejack and the Calvados. Um, one being that you can actually have a clear Applejack spirit where you don't have a clear Calvados spirit. Um, what we have with the Lairds here is a straight Applejack. Um, straight, meaning it's aged two years in new oak, uh, it doesn't limit itself to just whiskey. So the American government recognizes anything aged in new charred oak for two years. You can also see Laird's has a bottled and bond, meaning it's 50% alcohol, aged a minimum of four years, single distiller within a six month season of either January to June or July to December. And so Applejack, you could also have a gin that's bottled and bond or straight, but this one's aged two years with Laird's and they typically use um, New Jersey apples. So I'll have you guys try this. That's the first one. Oh, yeah, of course. Said, uh, you said it started in New York. What, what, what happened there? Did they moved to Jersey? For, like, oh yeah, well, so, that, so what we have for making um, American apple cider and apple jacking is New York, but Laird's is like the first company to get recognition and produce it on like a, a, on a larger scale. So it's the Laird's company has actually been around since the 1700s, but Martinelli's, which is the first um, apple juice company to do pasteurization, was until the 1800s. So Applejack actually predates what we have as consumer apple juice in the US. Again, it's, it's part of our history. It's something that George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, all of these guys, um, our founding fathers, would be familiar with, would be drinking. Um, but you know, luckily distillation was brought to the U S you could do the same thing you're doing with apple jacking. Um, you couldn't, so with this process, you wouldn't end up with the same result as with a cognac as you would with a wine 
or you wouldn't end up with a whiskey as you would with just putting beer in the ground. So that's why categorically it kind of has its own level um, of significance. Again, the first American-made spirit. And what I will have you guys check out is, oh, for yourself. <laughs> And so, oh, perfect. so there's a, there's a lot of varying differences. It's, you know, the Applejack was not something that was a French influence from Calvados. Um, Calvados isn't really too popular um, around the world. I think Applejack has a much better reputation, especially in the U.S. Aging in the new cooperage gives you much more flavor. You get a lot of more vanillin, vanilla, yeah, vanillin from the oak. You get more tannins. Apples have their own tannins as well. So that's why there is kind of a mad science to the blending and making of it, um, like you do with uh, making a wine. And um, you could just see the difference. Aging new cooperage and not new cooperage. This is gonna be a much quicker distillation. They're not gonna be doing pot stilling. Um, there's much more bang for your buck using a column still or a Vendome still with an American Applejack than with the uh, French style. Um, this might be a little bit more thinner and more flavorful while these are much more oily, more mouth-filling, um, and less concentrated. Uh, I do have a treat um, at the end. Here I have a Calvados that is aged 15 years. Um, so that's why we have a little bit darker color. Again, the focus isn't on the color. It probably aged in a much larger vat. Um, so I guess we could try this. Yeah, and maybe, yeah, we'll just try it on its own. Um, and then you can see the influence of oak and thyme that's taking place and how a long aging of 15 years of this versus a two years in brand new American oak. You're always going to use a neutral oak, whether it's American or French, for the Calvados process. You want the product to stand on its own. You don't want to bury it and hide it with all the oak flavors in there. That's everybody? So you're dealing with a much smaller region for apples to grow in France versus the amount that grapes have available. There's very few countries that have enough apples available to produce something like this. On that scale, the US, we have a lot of land. But in Europe, there's, there's so much more money and so much more focus on the wine. So sometimes these things get lost in the cracks, right? There's never a person promoting Calvados or Applejack too much. But again, that apple juice is something that we grew up with kids. It's one of the first fruits that's really focusing on how we evolved with time, how our ancestors really focused on their farming and their production and their excess, right? Like I need excess grains, I need excess grapes, I need excess apples to create my cider, my wine, or my beer. Um, and of course, we always need a little bit of aging with the Calvados just to get all that funk and those harsh elements out of the way. Uh, so this Ors de Age, Ors de Age, um, again, it could just be a minimum of six years. This goes all the way to 15. And it's just a much different animal. It still falls under the regular Calvados. It's not a Pédage and it's not a Dom Fontaine. Um, so this can be pot still, column still. It could be any combination of pears and apples. Um, but the aging now is the focus more than the other categories. And... I think that's it, guys. If you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. And if you don't have questions, that's fine, too. But we went from apple juice to cider, Palm de Normandy, two categories within Calvados, our American Applejack, and our extreme kind of age. You know, you can get Calvadoses that go up to 30 or 40 years, but 15 is a really nice addition, too. Um, but if there's no... Oh, question? So, uh, obviously... Uh... Liquor has like a, a huge history, and whether you look at the lens of like what cocktails they used to make in the past, and what they look at in the future, it's like mm -hmm. a pretty popular element of like you know gin, whiskey, bourbon. Mm -hmm. What is uh, apple-based spirits? What's what did they used to make, and what do they make? Well, apple-based spirits. I mean, this is it. We have tried not to mess with this stuff as much as we can. So, four hundred years of American history, five hundred years of French history, a thousand years of French history. What? what our great, 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 great grandparents were trying back in the day. Maybe we're lower alcohol, right? Without Louis Pasteur to show us about yeast 
and pasteurization and the proper fermentation of things. If this is 4% and this is 16 and this is 40, back in the day, it might have just been 1 to 3, 10%, and 25 to 30%. But really, the technology has not changed much. If we look at our lambic stills, um, the, we actually learned it from the Muslims while we were going through the Crusades. The, the priests and the monks that were out there um, brought the technology basically back with them. And then around the 1400s, we have uh, documentation of monks in Ireland distilling for the King of England. So, but from that 1400s, outside of tweaking recipes and working our fermentation, there's almost nothing different than what's going on. Um, it really can be played in a lot of cocktails too, um, but you don't see it too much. A lot of people just like to enjoy these on their own as an aperitif, as a regular, you know, after work beverage or just on their own. Um, America has done a lot better of promoting Applejack through its cocktails. Um, I feel like the French are a little bit more purists. You don't really hear about too many crazy Calvados cocktails. I love using it in like, um, like a white Negroni. So you're switching out your Lillet Blanc for something really unctuous and really dry, and it plays really well in those cocktails. The more aged spirits, you can do more in an Old Fashioned or a Manhattan, um, and you can do them one for one. Uh, but these are kind of like, it's like cousins to whiskey and to, and to cognac because those are so popular. And what it really was was access to ports. So, you know, like people would take cognac from France because they have a port right there and sailors brought it to the rest of the world. Um, and Applejack traveled around the US, but there was already so many spirits in that time in history. Um, you know, even at the time that we were making Applejack and Johnny Appleseed was around, rum was really the most popular. Um, Cause you know, you had trade with the Caribbean. There's a lot of sugarcane being produced. Um, and so that was really more of a bigger draw um, than even something like Applejack and also limited region and production. Um, you know, in the fortunate part of American history, there was a lot of slavery in the South. Um, and they had the working hands and they had the people to produce something on that scale where sugar cane can grow. Um, places like Florida, Louisiana, um, they have ports or they have the terrain to grow sugar cane. Whereas Applejack in the North, there wasn't as many slaves. You know, it was a lot of European countries in the South. So those French territories or Dutch territories really had a strong hold on and brought in a lot of slaves to get the work done. Where in the North, it was homesteaders. It was people who were just making apple pie or apple cider or cider or whiskey, but on a smaller scale. This was more of like an at-home thing than as like a global scale. That's why there's nobody who's competed with the Lairds in the last 300 years. You know, it's something that is really done so limited um, and really nuanced and it's incredible and tasty and can be used in a lot of different ways. Um, but really underutilized. Uh, and so, you know, hopefully with time and love, and I think our farmers need a lot of love and stuff like that. So that type of thing will grow. Any other questions? I mean, I had a question that was kind of, like you, you answered most of it. Okay. And the question was like, how do you see the future of Applejack in the States? Can it be kind of like something that is only like related to the history and culture or can mm -hmm. it be something like, hot and new and kind of like, you know, kind of like um, I would fighting the spirits that are kind of like now, now popular. They're really, they're really, the spirits we have nowadays are really established, right? Like bourbon is king. We have a lot of other brands that are out there. Um, the country that produces the most apples is China right now. And they send their juice to some cideries in the U.S. just because there's a pure volume and they can be on a production level. Um, there's a lot of great there are brands out there like Ironbound Cidery in New Jersey, I'm a big fan of, but you also have Angry Orchard. And I don't think that there's an Angry Orchard Orchard anywhere. I think they're buying in that juice. Um, I think a lot of land gets eaten up for like corn because it's a, a food source. It's used in ethanol. Um, they use it you know, to make high fructose corn syrup. So I think some of these farmers are hurting too where they can make more money or, you know, get more income. The government pays them to grow corn. I don't think they're paying them to grow apples. Um, and also the apples that we're growing are eating apples. So, you know, when we go apple picking, it's never going to be anything like this. So the farmer has to say, I got a good land to grow different types of apples. What am I going to go grow? 
I'm going to go eating apples. And so people can come up with their kids and do hay rides. Um, I don't think there's a lot of farmers out there that are like, I'm going to grow crab apples. And if I don't, all I can do is just sell this particular whiskey adjacent kind of product. Um, so I think this is more something that would need a lot of advocating on the ground level. I would love to see it really, really big, but I know that the farmers are not going to sacrifice getting a check from the government or having family fun days just to create something that, you know, no one else is knocking down the door for. There are brands out there. Um, I think it's called North Iron is one of them. Um, and there's plenty of in the Hudson Valley. There's a great, you know, tax benefit to be in the Hudson Valley and producing cider and, and beer and wine. Um, but yeah, I think it's something that's going to maintain. And if it blows up, it's going to be something like it was in a movie or a TV show. And then from one day to the next, it's going to be thousands and thousands of cases. I don't think it's, I would, like I said, I would love from the ground up for people to talk about it, incorporate it more. Um, like I said, it's got such a rich history to, from where we came from as human evolution, um, to what we have nowadays. But, you know, I don't think there's a further evolution. We can just focus on aging. We can focus on production choices. But yeah, I think it has to drop itself into pop culture. If it's not in pop culture, it's never going to happen. And it's going to be either or, right? It's either going to be Applejack's going to do really well or Calvados re really well. But I'm not going to, it's not going to be both. Um, and like I said, there's also a few, very few other cultures. Like you don't have English people making an Applejack. You don't have... Um, Spanish people making something like that, Portuguese, Italians. It is really a unique product to the U.S. and to the French, um, which they go kind of hand in hand, right? We, we, our Bill of Rights and things like that um, is kind of thanks to the French government and to the French people. So it's kind of playing ability together and it's kind of like an homage together. But yeah, the, the future of it, it's really going to be can you get in pop culture? That's where we focus on a lot of things, right? Like, where's my George Clooney for apple-based <laughs> spirits, right? Where are our celebrities at? Um, anybody else? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, like, uh, sorry. Uh, so, like, usually people who would consume, like, historically, do they, would you, like, do, like, as shots or like, all those kind of Definitely not. Definitely not shots. On the rocks? Yeah, out on the rocks, you can enjoy it. Like I said, uh, Cider, well, you know, the pump, Pomo de Normandy is going to be treated like an aperitif. So you're going to serve it a little bit cooler than room temperature. No ice or anything like that. Cider, you enjoy on its own. With these things in the Calvados, they're really flavorful. I mean, I would put this just like in a snifter like you would a brandy. Even let it warm up in your hand. Let those kind of fat oils that are part of the pot still process awaken with like with the heat of your hand. Um, and I think that's probably the best way to enjoy it. I wouldn't imagine anybody like shoves it full of ice and puts lemonade. Um, like I said, you can do cocktails with it. And I think maybe that's what, you know, to what Nicola's saying, maybe that's why it's falling behind. Maybe not enough people are incorporating it into cocktails and that's kind of the way to get onto the boat and be as popular as you would with other whiskeys. But I would really treat this like you would, um, like I said, a cognac or like a high-end single malt something like that. It, it's, it's really beautiful. It's really unctuous. It's not like anything else that we have. And like you had the apple juice and you had this. They're really not the same. Different type of apples, different type of production. So it deserves to kind of stand on its own. But again, unless people are using it cocktails, you know, um, which it doesn't need. But like you're saying, who are, how are people who are purists enjoying it now? Just neat. So the question was actually, uh, I know a few friends of mine actually told me that mezcal is not like actually, people don't drink it that much in Mexico, except in Oaxaca, like kind of more focusing on the yeah. climate. So the question would actually be, would the Calvados be consumed a lot, or like the most in the Normandy region, mm -hmm. or like in France generally speaking, or is there any particular part of the world that people actually kind of consume it the most? So th that's a great question. It's, it's really not that big of an export product. Uh, there is the Trail de Cidre, uh, which is in France. And in the part of that trail, since it is in the Normandy region, people literally just drive from farmhouse to farmhouse. The GPS can't even get you to them because it's just winding dirt roads. Um, but really, it's just for people who are visiting and they're, and they're checking it out. Um, it's a much cooler region, so it's not as sexy as Cannes, right, in the Mediterranean. Um, 
but you are going to be, you know, like I said, fairly west of, of Paris, so you can go there on a day trip. Um, but it's really going to be enjoyed there. The import market for Calvados isn't really big. Um, even all the big distribution houses, they don't carry more than three different labels. I mean, they, they did more than that. Kudos to them because I would love to know their secrets. Um, but that's more like you drink it when you're there. It's like the, like the sense of the moment. It's the zeitgeist. It's like I'm on vacation. I'm here. You know, Calvados is there. And maybe you get somebody who brings it back home with them. Um, but you don't see a big draw. I can go to, if there's a thousand French bistros in Manhattan right now, out of a thousand, maybe a couple dozen have Calvados. You know, they, they'll still lean towards cognac. That's like the big boy. That's the money maker. You know, they, they don't have Hennessy money. Uh, they don't have advertising dollars. You've never gone down, down the highway and a billboard said, drink your Calvados today or drink your Applejack. And so it's really more like local flair to Normandy. I think even in other parts of France, they don't drink it. Um, so it's really to that area. And then people, you know, we have a lot of expats in the US, so they enjoy these types of things. They grew up with these things. But I think if people knew how tasty they were, they would ask for it way more. Yeah, you know, I, I believe like in, in Serbia, it's kind of the same thing. Like, like you know, like Serbia or you know, like surrounding countries, both like the Balkan and whatnot, being a brandy, being able to make it out of anything, pretty much like apricots, pears, apples, grapes, whatever. Yeah, you know, like uh, well, mostly as well. Um, so you buy like it has like a very similar flavor to it, like you know, like that first hit. So like I feel that like once um, in my, like that area might actually be also like a good market for it by itself, you know, because like I, I feel like that the flavors that people in those regions go for as well, like it are like very similar to, to the colonies. Yeah, I mean, again, like as a farmer, you have extra whatever. So whether it's plums or cherries or whatever, if you're gonna ferment it, you know, getting people drunk is gonna give you way more money than getting giving people juice and then distilling it as well. So it's, it's a good way for a farmer to preserve, but it's always extra, right? So we have, um, you know, corn vodka in the US because we grow so much corn. So we just take the extra, ferment it and distill it. Or you're in, in the Netherlands and you have so much wheat, then you ferment and distill it. Or you're in um, Poland or something like that and you have so many potatoes, you ferment and distill it. Your role as, a, as an agriculturalist is to take whatever extra you have and to not lose your money. So that's very reflective of the culture. So if you have an excess amount of fruits that you can convert into the brandies, you're not importing that stuff in. The goal is take what you have, don't lose money, and if you can get it out of the country, even better. Um, but it, that's where so many cultures, you know, that's where they work, like going back to Oaxaca. It's because they grow agave there. Um, I don't expect the Calvados out there because that region's way too hot to grow apples. So it's reflective of the people and the place and the regionality to it. Um, Again, it's whatever photosynthesis gives you. You want your dry grain batteries or you want your wet grape batteries or something in between, you know, apples. Uh, they're actually 25% air. So they kind of sit in this weird space between the two of them where like grains have no water at all, grapes have too much, and apples are like this uh, uh, hodgepodge. But yeah, I think it's just a matter of, it's, it's a good way to represent your culture, to embrace it and to focus on its accessibility to the world, but it starts with, I guess, focusing on getting it in cocktails or education like this. So, um, but that's awesome. Thank you. Thank hey, Mario, you. thank you so much. Oh, you got it. Yeah, thank you. you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, everybody.